We're going to East Prussia, to the large area around where Hitler built his large headquarter complex. But first, a little history reminder. The Prussian Empire became known as an army with its own country, as it evolved and expanded from the Teutonic Knights, who built large, amazing fortresses all around their territories in Europe, until they finally joined with Germany and the other German-speaking territories to become the Greater Germanic Empire, which today covers territories from Poland, Kaliningrad, part of Ukraine, Belarus, and the Baltics. I have shown you the amazing forts the Prussians built, such as Vestemutsik, which is in today's France, built after the Prussians and Germans won the Franco-Prussian War. But let's visit former East Prussia, where Hitler had built his complex near the old Prussian city of Lutzen, today Gisetsko. Not far from the largest of the Prussian cities, where they constructed one of their beautiful large castles, which today exists no longer. Today's Kaliningrad, which was then Königsberg. During the Second World War, towards the end, it saw some of the most vicious fighting of the war. This ancient Germanic city was the first that saw occupation surrounding and fighting by the Russian army, and they took a vicious revenge on the German population there. Almost the entire male population was killed in the finding and the sieges and most of the women and children afterwards. The Russian and German army fought vicious battles all the way through East Prussia, littering it with battlefields, bunkers, fortifications, field fortifications and trenches you can still see today, which I will show you. However, already before the First World War, fortifications were constructed here. And during the First World War in 1914, this is where the Germans defended against the Russian army, who tried to strike through East Prussia, reaching Berlin in a quick, decisive victory. However, this was not to be. When looking at a map of East Prussia, one of the things that stands out is the Masurian lakes here. There's a vast network of rivers and lakes crisscrossing the area. This is one reason why Hitler felt safe in his headquarters there, as it was quite easy to defend, given that any enemy would have to cross a few bridges, roads that were easily defended. In fact, some of the fortifications defending the bridges and roadways through them dates back to after the Franco-Prussian War of 1871. And these are some of the most modern I've seen of the day. In fact, some of the bunkers and shelters I found here was very hard to date as to which war, before World War I or World War II. And indeed, the Masurian Lakes here is the very reason why the Battle of Tannenberg in 1914 developed the way it did. The Russians tried to make a decisive strike through East Prussia, straight to Berlin. They advanced with two large armies around the lakes. This made it possible for one German army to hold them in one place, while now led by Ludendorff and Hindenburg, one army, partly utilizing the rail system, wheeled around the lakes and hit the Russians straight in the flank, cutting off their main army, then encircling them and destroying that entire Russian army, taking over 90,000 prisoners and killing almost three times as many. We're not close to the area of the Battle of Tannenberg, but we are in the middle of the Masurian Lake system. And here, before World War I, some amazing constructions sprung up to defend the bridges and waterways. These now stand in dispersed amongst World War II Regelbauten, here built in clusters, creating fortified areas and defensive lines placed in order to defend, especially against Russian advances in 1944. This entire area have always been the sites of fortifications, and I truly have little idea of how many there really are left here, and not just German from World War I and World War II. Between the two wars, bunkers had also been constructed along the various frontiers facing each other. The Polish built some amazing fortified bunker lines facing a possible German advance from East Prussia. And of course, the Germans then, opposite them, in East Prussia, built bunkers preparing for a possible Polish attack. And the Germans did strike Poland from East Prussia, 
into the Polish frontier forts, which I'll show you later. And as the Russians invaded their part of Poland, and the Germans and Russians divided Poland between them, now on a direct border with each other, these former allies too in turn began constructing bunkers facing each other, with the Russians constructing the Molotov line on their part. Hitler's wolf lair was constructed among the lakes to the north, with the army headquarter bunker complex not so far. But the entire area of East Prussia also saw constructions of a lot of bunkers with many smaller independent fortified positions consisting of five to six large bunkers defending an area or possible avenue advance for the enemy. Towards 1944, many smaller bunkers and trenches with cement gun emplacements were constructed throughout East Prussia. It turned the entire area into one vast battlefield. And visiting, if you do not know what's really hiding on the fields, in the backyards, in the forests, you may miss something really interesting. Bunkers, forts, including the grandfather of the modern bunker, something I have never seen anywhere before. And here by the lake is a destroyed small personnel shelter. And there's a lot of these on the line. Right, as you can see, we are right in the between several of the lakes here and right next to the railroad. This is a very cool leftover from World War I. This is an, a machine gun tower that was used to defend the axe of the lake because here, during the First World War, was a lot of fighting with the Russians and the Germans. And I have to rephrase that because it was actually Finnish volunteers fighting for the Russians that was fighting the Germans here. Seeing these bunker towers, I feel like I found the missing link between the fortress and the bunker. These are guarding the road and bridge crossing in this section of the Missourian Lakes to the south. But also along the peninsula, we found trenches everywhere, gun positions, ammunition bunkers, and shelters. And these must have been constructed before World War I, but they look so modern they may as well have been from World War II. And some of these were used during the Second World War as well. But in the middle of one of these fortified lines, I found something really special that dates exactly when this was constructed. I know this is theoretically listed as a bunker. To me, it is the coolest little fortress that I would love to call Summer House. And I can't help but to wonder if this was used for the Second World War. These firing directions, these firing positions are pointing in the wrong direction, but it has looks like two floors and close defensive since this was pre the use of rebar and steel I can't tell if this damage is fire or just natural erosion you see the angle of firing positions and here you have the eastern facing direction that looks fairly pristine so I guess this was not really something that was used for the fire for the World War II and here quite possibly this could have been oh, that's another firing position so you're looking at three floors in all directions. What a cool little tower. That's something you don't see every day. But again, it's on the same line as all the other bunker positions. This does sort of look like an impact crater, but this is made all stone and cement. No rebar in this. In this area, there's three of these towers. Originally had a crew of 25 people and aimed with machine guns in all directions. Construction started in 1900, with, and it was enhanced in, with further additions added to it in 1907. We're on three levels. But I have to say, this is the best representation of a crossover between a middle-aged castle with firing grooves to a modern day bunker. It is a little bit of the, of the best, it, it really does. These are actually very, very neat. 
and this was built in the 19 from 1900 to 1907 and I would suppose that is makes them the some of the first single standing regular bunkers I mean this is practically the precursor to a pillbox and obviously it's closed because that's just the way life is in my world but see these steel door still moving the secured entrance wrapped in barbed wire and the railroad and river is right to my right here it's gonna walk around it since we all know I can't get into it and I'm bitter and annoyed. And this firing position is largest. This must have been a cannon. And the cannon that comes to mind is something similar to the five centimeter French, maybe a Hotchkiss. In fact, here is. In fact, right here is the actual river. The bridge is, as you can tell, to my right. For cannon firing positions and for machine guns on the lower groove. The other two had three stories. This looks like it only had two. And then, of course, the roof position. It was in 1900 to 1907. Worrying about air attacks was really not a thing. And there's even a little rare Caponier built onto the side of the actual bunker. It's such a small, con concealable position, but such a small, well defended. There are 25 people in here. Every window was manned by somebody with a gun or a cannon. Absolutely brilliant. I just love these bunker towers. I don't know what else to call them. I've never seen them anywhere else. I doubt they are anywhere else. Here are three of them. One is guarding the rail connection, the next is guarding the road bridge, and the third one another road bridge. These are then defended and intersected by trenches with bunkers interspersed. And fortunately one of these towers have been turned into a small museum by a man who promised to show us what they look like on the inside. The ceiling strength is about 20 centimeters and the walls are over 50 centimeters thick made of stone and cement. And in addition to the three towers in this area there was also barracks behind these and these are currently used for private housing. There's also six reinforced shelters along the riverbeds along with fighting positions there. These were all built to defend the river crossing here in the area and were heavily engaged in the fighting of World War I against the advancing Russian army. This was of course defeated initially in 1914, but they came back and tried again later. This is the only place in the world that our towers like these have been constructed. And the construction started in 1900. There was additions built onto them in 1907. There's three stories here. It was manned by 25 soldiers. The association here is a group of volunteers that formed in order to show tourists and history interested the fortress here, mostly of course in tourist season in the summer, along with those who visit the museum fortress in Gisetsko. And all the fittings here are still original from the time over a hundred years ago. Uh, it's original, yes, yeah, so uh, in the French you can see the numbers. Uh, really? Yes. They numbered the frames? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Obviously Prussians being the super Germans, they numbered the wooden window frames individually. And there was originally a small hatch to close the windows. One thing I really appreciate is the rifle racks. 
on the wall, they actually have a lip. So the soldiers, when they run past it, can grab their rifles in the same direction they're leaving out through. It's very efficient, very Prussian. And from the ceiling, there were shelves holding more ammunition. The sleeping quarters for the men who were stationed here was on the bottom floor. And even though it is the lowest floor right here next to the lake, it is still above water level, so there was no waterproofing incorporated in the construction here. It is a little chilly down here where the crews would live. Okay, so it was instead of uh, staircase. So they had the ladders instead? Yes. Yeah, this is the original one, isn't it? Yes. And during times of fighting, the floors would individually be closed off from each other by the heavy steel hatch here. Also, they would close up the floors in between. They would seal the floors in between. Mm -hmm. oh, yes, yes. This is all natural ventilation. There was natural ventilation that ran through pipes from the individual floors up and vented out through the roof. Except for the bottom floor, all of them had plenty of firing ports to open for clean air. There should also be some heater in here. In some capacity, the lower floor would get quite cold. But it's still not established exactly how that worked or what that was. Well, because, yes, yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing more fun than watching people crawl up a ladder. <laughs> oh, okay, that wasn't gracious. Uh, air circulation. So that's for the air? Yes. No heater? Uh, on any floor? Okay, so one is uh, minus one level and another to uh, ground level, zero level. So, and so there was, were there supposed to be soldiers up here as well, or was this sort of an emergency? So there were also soldiers, but uh, the barracks were somewhere there. Yeah. So somewhere there, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, so close to this railway area, you can see this base, which was here, which used to be here. Radio or? or? Just you have the spikes, uh, yes. Yeah, talking so pipes. Yes, yes. Sprache <laughs> Ruhe. <laughs> oh, of course. There was no electricity, but cables have been found, which may have proved to have been run here later. But one of the very cool things that was installed up here on the roof is something you should recognize if you paid attention. There's a stand for an anti-aircraft cannon, or a machine gun. The stand is currently sitting out through the front door since it's rather heavy to bring back up here. But remember when it comes to anti-aircraft, this was constructed in 1900 to 1907, well before the air wars of World War I. So they were thinking ahead here. Okay, so it's a water drainage? That would be helpful. And this was here? Oh, okay. Love it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Not this. So the, there was toilet. Here was the there. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, but previously, yes, from the very beginning, it wasn't here. Yes. Yeah? So that's why that they built defensible this. toilet. <laughs> <laughs> and since this is the only place you are going to see three of these, you have to come here and visit the museum. The other two towers I'm trying to gain access to, if they won't sell them to me outright, 
to see what's in there of remains, because this really does feel like the missing link of bunker construction from the era of fortresses. Now remember, I set firing positions nearby. Let's have a look at those. All throughout this little peninsula is overstrewn with trenches running between the towers and here to a small bunker. And if you ever had any doubts as to who built this, you have but to take a look at the forward observation point here. You see, you can almost imagine how a small Fahrpanzer would have sat in there and down there. So, of course, these were built by the Prussians. And we know this because they developed this technology at Feste Wagner, or Mutzig. And at Feste Mutzig we saw exactly this. You actually see the plate where the rails would be for the Fahrpanzer. That would sit here and observe over this parapet with this little five centimeter cannon shooting at the enemy over there. That's amazing. I had no idea that they were going to have these here. Two munition shelters for two Fahrpanzers. I wonder if they ever showed up. They, I would almost believe they did. So now I have to find out what happened to them. Oh, steel shelters, steel doors on there. Little rail to there. Horses would have brought it in from here. And again, trenches leading to behind the position. So this was a purpose-built position for the Fahrpanzer. That's awesome. And see the trenches running down here to the shelter. And throughout this entire area, there are just trenches. Never underestimate how important trenches are and were. It's very hard to not fall in love with the Fahrpanzer. It was one of the interesting solutions the Prussians developed before World War I. A mobile steel pillbox with a gun and it only weighed two tons. From the perspective of the infantry and of the military procurement office, I could see the appeal of the Fahrpanzer. It was light, it was cheap, it was operated by a small crew, and it could be transported after horses, on trucks, or on the beds of trains. It was easy to put in position, and it was hard to see. It could lend the infantry support, firing both canister shot and shrapnel. It had a range between 400 and 3200 meters, firing several different types of guns. One, a 3.7 millimeter cannon, and the other, a 5.3 centimeter cannon. It was lightly armored, but being dug in, it was still fairly safe in concealment. But again, we are back to it being highly mobile, easy to use, easy to operate, few people. It could almost be the same thing you would say for a Panzer I or Panzer II in years to come. This was the direction armor was going to have in order to protect infantry. You give them light weaponry that's easy to use, you send them off to the front, both for defense and attack. The Fahrpanzer was awesome, and they were exported all over the world and saw different combat scenarios from the early 1900s. Some 400 of them were made that we know of, as quite many more were made under license. And of course here in East Prussia, they were also in position, given that this was Prussian territory, so of course they were guarding the waterways here. Just like World War I, fighting soldiers or digging trenches, binding them to wood, just like they did before World War I. There's no fighting here during World War II for them. But for World War I, there was battles with the Russians here. And here's the shelter, built long before World War I. Construction plan started in 1900, along with the bridge towers. This is a small fortified line in its own right that began before World War I. And I see the roof of the little infantry shelter over there. 
boat's collapsed, but I still see it just the same. See? Small infantry shelter. Right here, see the hall. Maybe that's even a hallway from the bunker. But these are bunkers from before the First World War. And they look, well, they look pretty damn good. This certainly looks like World War II and everything in between. Close defense support and everything. There's a little bunker stove. There must have been some. Steel door that was in here. Steel shutter on the inside of here. Again, a little communication window. So you can talk to the infantry without having to actually open up the bunker, which is just this. So a little command post. And even here, long before World War I, you see a close defensive point with a steel plate. That's um, somewhat mind-blowing, to be quite honest. And even the ceilings here, steel beams, just like you see in the Labour Park in World War II. Again, this was built between 1900 and 1907. Hooks for a couple of bunks. Could probably set four men in here. I don't think there's any wood in the walls. There's not. This is definitely something you haven't seen before. Of course, there would have been a steel door there. A little ventilation there. Looks like a slide. Yeah, this will be quite good. So you can open and close this. Probably a pipe burning through here that would have protruded somewhere. It could also have been a speaking tube to the Fahrpanzer up front. And honestly, for a position like this, the Fahrpanzer is an absolute great choice. A little mobile pillbox. Brilliant. Heavy steel beam over there, over the window. Heavy corrugated iron out here. Steel beams inside. I keep reminding you that this was before World War One, years before World War One. Brilliant. And right here from the position, if this house, which is new, was not there, you'd be able to see the tower, and the tower would be able to see you. And the direction of the enemy is that way. And up here you can still see the trench, zigzag trench. Very nice zigzag trench, actually. That runs down here to the water's edge, then runs parallel all the way around to the next tower. Several lines of trenches just run parallel with the water all the way up to the little town. This is also where the barracks were, behind the towers. The only thing I do not understand about this brilliant position here is why on earth they didn't reman it and fight for it during the Second World War. If they were prepared to do so at the First World War successfully, and the infrastructure is here, what the hell, at least do a delaying action. And a little bit further down on the peninsula from the last, it's the next shelter. Now I'll take a look at the shelter first, but I gotta tell you, I am excited to see if there's a position for Fahrpanzer on top of it or behind it. Wood in the walls, as we see in Regelbauten. Close defense. Steel beams in the ceiling. I mean, this is so World War II, all of it. Steel door, heavy steel door. Small room. And here you can actually see the bunk beds that were hanging here. So, but I don't think they had wood. There's wood in the walls, just like Regelbaum. And this is World War I. I mean, steel plate on the firing position. 
hooks for the beds on one side. This is almost as if it was built by the priest taught himself. Ventilation over the slide. This is absolutely amazing. It built before World War I exactly almost the same way after World War II. And I just kid something. There's actually a pole there. I don't know why. Maybe that was for a leg for a bed or a chair or a stand. But you see everything in here that you're used to seeing in World War II. And all these are, of course, are wood embedded in the walls. The bed hangers here. And this is a small, what would you be able to have here? Two, four, six beds. And maybe a table here, maybe a radio, telephone, whatever communication they had. This is very modern, even if it is very small, it is an indication of where the technology was going and how far advanced it was here. Remember, this is still in a time before they dug the trenches in Verdun or Sudan or the Somme. My heart breaks a little that on top of it there is no Fapanza here. But you see the water right there. To the left of this direction are the two bridge tower bunkers guarding the railroad. And here on top of the bunker, well, you don't see anything protruding here. Well hidden. Even if, of course, this road is new, there would have been a trench. And seriously, there's even hooks for the camouflage netting here. This bunker in itself, built between 1900 and 1907, incorporates every innovation of bunker design 1940s Regal Bauten. They had all the right ideas and they enacted them right here. So when we leave this area and the Fahrpanzers, we move a little further east down the same road. Suddenly we start seeing defenses of this road that are a little more modern. Here's a Pak bunker, and not far from that is a machine gun bunker as well. And these are pretty straightforward, exactly what they are. And you would pull the anti-tank cannon up from there, the little path, and right, right here, where the car is parked, in the puck position. It was down here low, so the shield would from direct fire. And there would probably be a little machine gun position as well. This could do with a little bit of cleaning up, I guess. But... Let's go have a look. And sadly, it is somewhat neglected and full of stuff. But, we can go in. This is the crew compartment. It's pretty straightforward and simple. What the crew would be. communications and of course the cannon would live in there you have wood on the floors it'll probably have been wood here in the walls as well ventilation shelves I wish you could see some writing but there's some faint writing under this, but I can't see it unfortunately. There's somebody trying to, there's actually a fairly solid wooden beam here. It's a four by four. Somewhat unusual, I would say. Don't know how thick the roof is on this, but um, and you also notice that here, you don't have the steel beams, cross beams over like you would in other places. And of course, some of this paint 
could very easily have been post-war graffiti or what have you. This is just big enough for a pack 36. And that's it. Then it will come up here and they will roll it up here into a little wall and face it that way. And about 200 meters from the pack bunker is another small Heinrich. And there's a lot of these in these forests. This, however, is interestingly enough, is defending the rear direction, the opposing direction, that the puck guns, both of the puck guns, are facing. They're facing to the east. This is facing the opposite direction. This is a small two-man crew bunker. But this should begin to give you an idea that the Germans were actually building a line, a proper line of relatively small fighting positions interspersed a lot with infantry, foxholes, landmines, cavalry obstacles, anti-tank mines, and so on. Of course, anti-tank ditches. Pure and simple, corrugated metal with cement and a little rebar over. And this is exactly what that is. And there's so many, many of these. There's a Panzerplatte here, up in some centimeters of steel behind the uh, cement here, guarding the opposite direction of the road. The trenches that ran all along the road and throughout the forest, running here to this bunker, and this entire forest section is full of small bunkers like this and trenches interspersed. And a little further down this same road, things suddenly grow into real large Regelbauten, Big bunkers, huge machine guns, as this is a small part of a defensive position, full of anti-cavalry trenches, with Panzerplatte, steel domes and all. Again, there is a Mannschaft bunker, a personnel bunker, and right here, a father, a son, and a grandfather team have taken this little Mannschaft bunker under their wings, and they have restored it all themselves, turned it into an amazing museum, they're going to give us a glimpse of how the German soldiers lived and fought here and tell us about this area during the Second World War. So that's camouflaged as a barn? Yes. But this bunker was also uh, open for the public to see how German armies was working. It, it's one of the rarest bunkers in Poland because it's a regular 107. It's a comp bunker. It's the one we have. It, it's here. Is a one of the the propaganda bunker, which has everything that a regular one hundred and seven should have. I think that's pretty damn amazing. And it's a family business. This. So this is literally a father and son project. <laughs> Not exactly father and son project. I'm just a volunteer from the reenactment group. You're his son, you're voluntold. 50-50. <laughs> so how did your dad get involved in this? How did he find the interest? Same story he has with me, because of his dad, my grandfather. So it's a family event. It all started in about 2007, maybe. Uh, my father, who is the president of the association that takes care of the, the bunker, the bunker line, uh, has found it because his father showed it him this bunker. It was in, uh, as we found it with more people, it was in a state of ruin. Trash inside, dirt, wood, even burned tires and a bunch of empty Panzerfaust tubes in the chimney. So we decided we have to do something with it. So we start to clean, clear it, uh, renovate, uh, a couple of years later, here we are. Someone has to take care of the history, even if it's in the shape of the bunker seized by the army of the most tyrannical state that ever existed. And it's also part of a history of our region. So, what's better way to memorize it to than to restore one of the pieces of history?
Well, this bunker is one of the uh, first few, first built Rigobel 502s. In fact, it's a prototype bunker. There are some differences mainly in construction, like smaller entrances only available in this one, which were later re removed from the mass build because they slowed down infantry from entering the bunker and exiting the bunker. And the prototype only had one heating stove, which, as you would have expected by the winters that are here, here it didn't work out as well. So in mass build they added additional second one. It, the crew of the bunker consisted of 26 soldiers. 14 of them slept in this section of the room, which is now a museum section, and another 12 slept in that section of the room. Shall we go? Yeah. So this was built in 1939? Yes, by the Germans. Germans expected that the Polish might have an idea to attack the Eastern Prussia, which they did. The Polish army actually attacked Eastern Prussia in 1939, just as the war began. But it was more of a small bordering incursion, which was pushed back by the Germans. Was it because they knew the Germans was about to attack, or was uh, it... It was at the same time as the German attack. So it was a counter. It was it was a, a spoiling attack. It was um, honestly, I don't have exactly any information about it. It was more of a something like border raid. Okay. But it failed, and uh, it was ultimately futile. So how many bunkers did the German build facing the Polish? Oh, from the Johannesburg line. Yeah about 21 that I know so far but it might it's not exact estimate because it's consists all of the bunkers both from 1939 and 1944 and the many of these they built here in 39 was the test beds for the Regelbauten concept uh, yes wow and go on I'm, I'm intrigued uh, the armor of this bunker consisted of two meters of reinforced concrete but the concrete itself didn't protect the troops. What really protected them is the steel ceiling that we can see above our heads. It, it was meant to prevent the uh, shock wave from killing the crew as well as the concrete fragments to essentially act as a fragmentation from hand grenades. It doesn't mean that crew wasn't uh, harmed. They, w what? they were harmed, mostly by the pr pressure, pressure difference that caused them to either blow their eardrums or simply pass out unconscious. It happened, it was documented, but they still lived. The most intriguing here, and most uh, you might have questions about, is was the co wood coverings on the walls. Were they in the bunkers? At the start of the war, yes, they were. Man mainly to isolated troops from the cold of the walls and to absorb some of the moisture that was ever present here. The one of the greatest examples of their creativity was with the with those types of beds. Because you could detach them from the, the chains and use them either as additional seating or completely remove them and use them as a stretchers. Something the designer of those beds didn't predict. So in the later the upgrade updated versions, they added the handles to ease the carrying the wounded on the us. Oh, no. Really? Yeah. There was no kitchen in this bunker, so, so the food for the soldiers was mostly delivered by the field kitchen in the large backpack thermos, which can be seen here. I'll show if you want, of course. This you will be surprised, but I started my career with 11 years in the Danish army. We still use those. Oh! In the Polish <laughs> army, it's almost, almost identical are still being used. But yeah. I don't know if, they, if right now they're being replaced or are still used. It's hard to beat a good idea. Mm. If it works, it works. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but there might be a chance that field kitchen was unavailable or troops couldn't leave their fighting positions. So, in the bunkers there were also a food supply for the uh, about three days of uh, combat. As drinking water was supplied almost every day, be it in the form of the water cans or 
bottled water. Back then, uh, saturated with the uh, soda water. Mm -hmm. The was big problem with uh, water for cleaning purposes for the hygiene. It didn't have any uh, sewage system, so they had to rush in the water for the whole day. Each and every single of those one of those soldiers had to about two liters of water per, per day to use for for whole day. And there's no bathroom facilities inside. No, only water tank behind you, sir, and the bowl, bowl to cl clean. So in case they were closed in due to combat or attack, was there a backup plan bucket? Nope. That's uh, bad. I mean, for as the for the toiletry. Yeah. There was. Okay. Uh, it was called the dry toilet. It mm. was essentially a bucket, more, more of a barrel, hermetically sealed barrel covered in wood. On, yes. In this bunker, there were two in uh, entrances to the bunker. There were also either one or two boxes full of pit. So one, so, one soldier uh, took its physical needs into the dry toilet. It took soldier took one shovel, one full shovel of the pit and covered up. Yeah. Basically, they were like cats taking uh, the litter. using the yeah. litter. Yep. Uh, electric electricity here was transported from the city network. There wasn't any power generators in this bunker, except for the accumulate back batteries for the emergency use. So, uh, if they were died along with the city network, they had to use the. Um, Candles, the uh, carbide uh, lamps, or uh, oil lamps. Where do you find some of yes, It's that right, is so yes. cool. Where do you find that? I would like to have something at home. Oh, <laughs> God, this is cool. Yeah. With a little. Oh, my God, I want one. I really. I, I do. I, holy shit. God, I love this guy. There is the ladder to the observation dome. And I did not know that they used the rooms in the observation that are for storage as well. I have learned something today. Oh, I knew this was gonna be a good day. This is the observation dome. That is so insanely cool. And I can even see the hatches on the dome up there. Let's stop completely. <laughs> okay. Alright. Here he goes. Well, what I think is cool is it doesn't fly away. Settle in the hole as well. Oh. This is a last combat used Nebelwerfer shell in Poland. When it was last used? In 2006. A junkyard owner got this shell from a, the collector who decided to sell it. So he sold it and he knew that it had a explosive materials in it. The people from the town when it happened, Womsha, are very specific people that once they d d realize that something has a explosive and they live near the river, they will realize they can have a free fish. So, this genius put it under his feet and cut it with the... Uh, uh, torch? Torch, yes. That's what I was afraid you were going to yeah. say. As you can see, he cut off the uh, nose of the shell. And for Maybe fortunately it didn't have a warhead, but unfortunately it had a fuel, the compressed can powder. So, the fuel ignited, engine started, flew over two kilometers over the warm shop, and landed in this car. <laughs> the owner of this car was lucky that he left the car about five minutes before the impact. The army didn't want this shell. The prosecutor office didn't want this shell. The owner didn't want this shell, so the association took it. 
However, we want to buy this shell for twice the amount of money he, the owner uh, got it for because we wanted to get it for about 12 zloty. But to quote the owner of the sh the former owner of the shell, I quote, get this fucking thing away from me. <laughs> and that's how we have the last combat used Neville Verfer in Poland. There, you, you know you're fueling a whole bunch of Polish stereotypes and other things. <laughs> I don't care. Yeah, good, because... <laughs> it even has the uh, molten plastic on the r r rim of the uh, <clears throat> exhausts. Now, I'm, I'm just wondering, in what planet do you think it's a great idea to take a torch <laughs> to a rocket? Ever? Lightweight gem gas through doors. Germans had a really sick sense of humor when it comes to the ter terms lightweight. Those doors weigh almost uh, 500 kilos. Almost. See, it swings open, it's super yeah. light. Mainly, mainly because of the ball bearings in the. Uh... Yeah. What, 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 what am I this is the second entrance set. It's our so, third. So there was a protected. What is this? It's a cabinet for the gas. Co there, actually, there actually was a cabinet for that. That's yes. what there was a cabinet. Yes, that was, they put their uh, clothes, that uniforms that were covered in poison gas in in there, and they entered the bunker to get the fresh, their fresh uh, uniforms. There was no. This was. This was still. Still outside. There was no. Uh, this was the lady. The, the that old. That was in the. Uh, in the corridor. That was. There was a door. Something. Yes. There was a door. There was this door, yeah. and then there. It was. It was a two-piece door like this one. Yeah. That we suddenly have. And one. then they had this cabinet. Cabinet. You know what? I did not. This know. was airlock. Yes. Thank so you. there actually was an airlock, yes. which is why the ventilation is right behind you. Yes. And the open clothes vent, and then they put the clothes in there. But there's no shower or anything. No. Nope. It was just change of clothes, and then change of clothes. So would the guys before they came in put the clean clothes in there? No, they, they put the gas covered contaminated clothes in there, and they took the uh, one fresh ones from the inside of the bunker. Very cool. And you know the company that did these are still in business, doing exactly the same thing today. Russia. Yeah. And this was for the uh, telephone wires. This was so uh, infantry could plug in from the outside. Uh, yes. So they could without having to go in. This pile of debris that looks like it doesn't belong here is actually a bunker. How you may ask, how is it a bunker? At old rail stations, uh, train stations, uh, old villages, there were small concrete table-like objects near them with the holes in them. Those were bunkers. We will try to res rebuild one in here to show the view how such bunker looked like so people can get inside, see how it was from the inside, Get full experience of the train station guard. So is this not similar to something like this? No, that one was simply to defend the train station from, say, partisans or small raiding parties. So a small guard bunker with a yes. machine gun slot, basically. Something like that, yes. This one is actually a civil defense bunker, the Luftschutzzelle. The producer of this bunker was a company called Divida. For three people and... One of the biggest factories, uh, factories that made this was actually in Auschwitz. There we go. So this is reinforced cement? Reinforced or just concrete. Concrete, yeah, of course. Po prawej stronie u góry jest tabliczka znamionowa właśnie z nazwą firmy. On the right side of the bunker from the inside, you can see the uh, plate with the name of the company. Right. So I see you don't see much. Yep. Oh, there's the plate. Yes. I'm actually. Did, did they put a plate inside each one of these? Uh, yes. 
and put a little metal plate inside each one of these, and they built thousands of these, I'm guessing. Yep. That's... One of them is still standing on the, on the train stations. Why would you need a manufacturer's plate in it? I just, I, you gotta love it. Ridiculously simple, cheap combat bunkers, combat fighting positions. So-called cock bunkers. Cock because the one of the producers of those was a concrete fa factory that was uh, directed by Erich Koch, the Gauleiter of the Eastern Prussia. It was really effective, hard to detect and hard to destroy bunkers because they were digged, they were in the ground um, about this height and it's safe to say it's the first modular bunker to be made. On single uh, body of the bunker you could put a machine gun nest, a guy with the grenade launch, anti-tank grenade launcher, with the different uh, rooftop you could put on a radio station, periscope or just a shelter. If you had any remaining bodies you could of this bunker, the cock bunker, you could make a tunnel network to connect different cock bunkers into one coherent network. So if one was destroyed, the soldier could crawl up to another and continue fighting. So not only could they be used modularly to be put up, you could also connect them with the same modulars, yes. and they would be that would be that would be at ground level. So that's smart. Yes. And it looks like a lot, quite a bit of steel rebar in there as well. Yes. Uh, there is one place near uh, our town where there is just a bunch of them on the hills. I almost broke my leg on one. Oh, you got the little, uh, is that an MG, MG ring? Uh, yes, we also have the MG, uh, uh, we have also the MG mount for it, but it's cumbersome to, and uh, having to carry it actually. That's very simple. Uh, yes. Guard. Guard. We have, this is actually made out of steel, unlike the more common concrete ones. Why it was made out of steel? First, a little backstory on where it was made. It was made in Emblong, where during war there was a shipyard that, ship, Schichau sh uh, shipyard that during war made for the Kriegsmarine the uh, Schnellbots as well as the uh, Zihun submarines. They had to make uh, something for their own uh, factory guards so they could hide themselves during air raids. And duration of time to wait for the arrival of the concrete bunkers was so long that they decided to just build one themselves. You can actually see that it, the holes were cut in by hand and they made it from the materials they had on hand, from the rigid hull of the Zihud. That's brilliant. So, they, so they, they, they built it and then they just cut them out with a torch after? Yes. Now I can't help but to notice that there's quite a bit of holes in this. Those are after the war. Some uh, all soldiers decided to test their rifles. On. What were they firing through this? I think AKs maybe. AKs, BKMs. Really? You think that would go through this? Yeah. It's yeah, millimeter Yeah. Okay. All right. It has only 10 millimeters. So yeah, that's true. I mean, still, that's a little. If you'd like to have a shelter that could, so there's a guard shelter that could withstand a little bit of gunfire. So is that an emergency exit? Ten odpor tu tak jest wyjście waryna? Nie wiem. We don't know. Tam jest ona. Are those wooden poles? Those are actually tank traps called hippo teeth. You may ask yourself how such a piece of wood can stop a tank. They are put on like on a chest. Chess pattern, checker pattern. Yes. One is higher, one is lower. Tank drives up to on it, and at one point he reaches with the bottom of his hole, hangs on the bottom of the hole, and tank stops. He becomes a can on a shooting range. He can stop not only the older tanks but also the modern MBTs as well.
So how far down are they dug? Jak głęboko jest zakopywana? Około dwóch metrów. About two meters deep. And of course we have the barbed wire, which is meant to slow down the infantry advance. Uh, we uh, have a lot of uh, World War One pigtails. Yes. Actually, both of them are from World War One. They are, aren't they? Yes. Yes. I mean, um, I mean, after World War One, why would you need to improve on something that worked? I mean, Germans made a lot of dolls during yeah. World War One as well, so they used them in World War Two as well. Ironically, the biggest, best users post-war of those uh, poles are farmers. Most of them we brought from uh, farming uh, farms. Yep, I know. I see that all over France as well. <laughs> Going in a different direction away from the bunker. You have more. You're hiding stuff from me. This is a gun pit for the Pack 36 gun. This was bunker mainly for the Pack 36 uh, anti tank gun. Sadly, we're not. So this this was actually this is where they would used to so if they had time they would build up a little. A little, uh, yes, this uh, was actually built in 1944 uh, on the orders of Heinz Guderian because Germans knew they will lose the war so, war, so they needed to set up a defensive positions to at least slow down the Russians. So they built them up and manned them only for them to not be used in combat. Why weren't they used in combat? Because the commander of defense of the Johannesburg at the time realized that Johannesburg isn't strategic to Germany. What was Johannesburg at the time? A small lakeside town uh, with just one beer brewery. I know, very important to us men. But it wasn't very strategic, strategic to the, uh, Germany. And he knew, knew that Russians are literally at the doors. So, what did he do? He ordered the civilians and met his own men to retreat. They retreated in the cover of the night and Russians didn't even notice. The next day they entered the empty city. Russian commander was terrified because how he could let those German fascists escape. For this, the NKVD would execute him. So what did he do? He put the entire city in the cordon and shut it off for about half a year. The city was destroyed in 80% and later they reported that there was a fi heavy fightings in uh, Pish. And Pish right now, back in New Johannesburg. And Russians still believe that there were fighting, there was heavy fightings in New Johannesburg. So was there a lot of civilian casualties or? There wasn't, I, I don't think so. So everybody just fled and left and the Russians just sat here and shot up empty town. Yes. Yep. Typical Russian work. <laughs> and as I said r earlier, Russians still believe in this bullshit story. S they believe it so much that the, at the start of the K Crimea crisis in 2014, I believe, the Russian motorcycle club uh, Nightwolves came to Pish and left the table, the uh, plate. Uh, saying glory to the Soviet liberators of Johannesburg along with the second plate with the list of casualties in the city. We took it down, we traced the casualty list and what turns out? One died in uh, Breslau, other at Danzig, other God knows where else. We later compiled it, sent it to the Russian embassy, told them to shove it up there. Time to clean. As we can see here, this is a one bunker. As I said earlier, this bunker is actually connected from two bunkers into one. One garage bunker for the anti-tank gun and one small MG bunker. The MG part of the bunker is seen from the from the side of the road, which we will shortly see. When there was a combat alert, the German anti-tank crew had to pull the gun out and roll it up to the gun pit and then later fire in general direction of the enemy. Back then there was no forest, no buildings, so they had clear shot of the enemy. Well, the MG bunker fired in that direction. 
Shall we see the uh, yeah. MG Punks? This. <laughs> and this is actually the second bunker in that connected MG Schagen, Schattenstand bunker. The MG Nest. This one had a MG08 machine gun. Not, not every bunker had MG42s or MG34s as movies tend to show us, like Saving Private Ryan or uh, other movies. Some of them had older machine guns like Maxims, like uh, MG08s or rep repurposed uh, aircraft machine guns like MG151 and 131. MG crew of this bunker often work with the heavy combat bunker on the other side of the road uh, in what we call the uh, dagger fire. The, uh, Flanking fire, flank fire uh, throughout uh, the forest. Uh, 50 meters away from it, there's a anti-cavalry ditch. Anti-cavalry ditch? Yes, just in case the cavalry were to attack. So over there? They fell? Yes. Yeah, that's the anti-cavalry, I gotta see. It wasn't a tank ditch, it was an anti-cavalry That sounds like that would be deeper than a tank ditch. It would certainly break horse legs. I am officially in the cavalry right now. <laughs> I am in the 26th MOD. Oh. We have horses who do most research and rescue. Oh. So, I sort of know. <laughs> I... Of course, it would be deeper than it is right now. Yeah, so, um... A cavalry ditch. Okay. Yes. So, would there have been spikes or anything in the bottom of it? There were barbed wire, double barbed wire. Fences. So the horses would get in and get entangled in the yes. barbed wire. Yes. And the horses were uh, the Russians were using cavalry. It was mainly against the uh, Polish cavalry. So it was 1939. Oh really? Yes. Granica, granica z Polską to jest kilkanaście kilometrów stąd była po drodze. Powiedziałem tym jakby nie pierwszy w stronie. Tak to przyszedł. Well, that brings me to ask, since I wrote a book about where I put that in. Did the Polish cavalry, 1939, charge the Germans or not? Did the charge the German tanks? Yes. The, the whole myth? The cavalry faktycznie zaatakowała czołg? Nie. To jest zabieg propagandowy. It was just a propaganda myth made up by Germans. Now I have to rewrite my book? On teraz musi na nowo napisać tę nową książkę. It's a novel. It's a novel I wrote. I liked it, but I always liked that story. Grudziądzu była centralna szkoła kawalerii, która studentów miała z tego świata, między innymi z ze Stanów. However, in Grudziądz there was a cavalry school that had a lot of students from around the world, including the Americans. Polska taktyka kawalerii była oparta na najlepszych doświadczeniach kawalerii z trzech byłych państw zaborczych, z Rosji, z Niemiec i z Autowęgier. The entire Polish tactics of the cavalry was based on experiences of the cavalry from Russia, Germany and Austro-Hungary during World War One. They put them together and created their own tactics. A tą taktykę z potem wykorzystano skutecznie w czasie wojny w 20 roku. And this tactic was later very effectively used in 1920 war, Polish-Soviet war. A sam problem szarżowania na czołgi wziął się w czasie bitwy pod Mokrą. However, the entire the problem with the Polish cavalry charging the tanks has started in battle at Mokra. I po prostu chodziło o to, że pod niemie Polska kolona kawalerii wyszła bokiem pod niemieckie lufy czołgów. And the Polish cavalry came from the side under the barrels of the German tanks. I dowódca podjął jedyną słuszną decyzję, wykonał zwrot i szarżował między czołgami. Niemcy nie zdążyli zmieniać celowników nastaw w armatach i w karabinach maszynowych. So the Polish commander did the only right decision. He just turned his unit at the Germans and charged through the German tank lines. Germans didn't have time to change the uh, settings of the optics and it set up set the targets on them. 
So they didn't charge the tanks, they r rode through the tank column. Yes. That's good enough. Wystarczy jest dobra dla jego powieść. <laughs> um, a wymyślił ten, ten, ten motyw z szablą na, na, na czołgi włoski korespondent y, wojenny, który towarzyszył Niemcom i on po prostu źle to czytał, a Niemcy the, wykorzystali. The uh, entire myth, however, was made up not only by the Germans, but mainly by Italian war correspondent who saw this uh, uh, image of uh, the sight of Polish cavalrymen charging with sabers at the German tanks. He wrongly interpreted it and Germans picked up on it. I'm surprised that I mean, the Polish would ever deny it because it's a damn good story. Makes sense. Our cavalry mostly fought like normal infantry. The horses me meant were meant to be used as a transport. When they went to combat, they mostly get got, got off the horses and fought like normal infantry. We have a second uh, anti-tank uh, gun garage bunker on the other side. Mm -hmm. We have the anti-tank traps here and here. I zagrożenie z tamtej strony. And threat from that side. So the uh, tank column would stop on this tank trap to, and try to go through it somehow. I to jest ten czas dla and it's pracy this time, it's time to shine for those two anti-tank guns. The Germans were not allowed to, to have fortifications. Yes. So, so how do they uh, make a round of it? The Germans, German army bought a pieces of land and they were marked as pieces of gem, German military pro property. And when they decided to screw the Versailles, we are rearming, they started building fortifications on those bought properties. So they started building these properties, buying these properties already in the 20s? Yes. But they were, and they didn't start, but they, but they started building. In the 30s. And they started building some of this before Hitler came to power as well? Uh, no, just after. Just after? Just after. And then they built for the 39, then after the invasion of Poland, did they start building bunkers against the Molotov line, against the Russians? Mm, officially, it was like, at our friendship we are building fortification, so, so Germans, they did the same, in our friendship and alliance we, do, we also f expand our fortifications. And it's bad for about a, couple, a lot of kilometers. So the Russians built the Molotov line and the Germans built the line here facing the Russians? Not only here, that was just a Johannesburg line was just a piece of one big line. Jak się nazywa ta linia? Linia fortyfikacji wzdłuż pisy? Wzdłuż pisy? Kalindersztalun. Ale wie, także jest część przecież. Kalindersztalun nie jest chyba aż tak długa, że na wielkości całej linii, także mołotowe. Nie, ona ciągnie się na odległości 57 km. The Johannesburg line was a piece part of the Kalindersztalun line, which was about 50 km of fortifications. Almost, almost uh, the almost keyword uh, entire length of the Molotov line. So how many? What what, what was built? Mm, it's a, from the Galindestalung. Yeah. Uh, or so Johannesburg line. So it was built from the Galindestalung. Galindestalung is built on a bridge on the river Pisa. The entirety of the Galindestalung was designed on our river Pisa because Russians have only crossed the places where there is a dry land. I tam są tam są schrony w punktach opo w, grup w grupach w punktach oporu rozstawione w takich no newralgicznych miejscach. And the bunkers are focused on the resistance points like in the most vulnerable uh, places like cr yeah. river cross cr crossings where the Russians could cross with the wet, dry feet all that stuff. Yeah. Czasami to wystarczył dosłownie jeden schron tak jak w Turośli gdzie Jeden ciężki karabin maszynowy blokował dolinę Pisy na, na szerokości na około kilometra i tam tylko można było się przedostać. Hmm, for example, it, sometimes it just require one bunker to secure a one piece of uh, the lines. So for example, in Turoshu there is one bunker for the heavy machine gun that effectively secured uh, a full valley of the Pisa River for a uh, Length of, of about a kilometer. So they are building very few bunkers in strategic places and reinforced it, by infantry. It depends on the, on the 
other places. Some had one, some had more bunkers, only to see, just so they could secure those places. But today only some 20 of these survive. All of them. All of them from the Galindo Stolen are surviving. They are? Yes. How many are there? It's hard to say. About 40. About 40. About. Oh well, I guess I know what I'll be doing for a while. You may now begin to understand that East Prussia is far more than just Hitler's headquarters bunkers. There's is one enormous battlefield. And next I'm going to show you one of the fortified bunker positions consisting of five large bunkers with steel domes and Panzerplatte that were set up as a defensive area. And I'll take you to the battlefield where the cock bunkers were actually in use interspersed in the trenches and small bunkers in a fighting position facing east to the east of the Masurian lakes. Also there's a cluster of fortified bunkers near Wolf's Lair interspersed with some World War I possibly bunkers that I'll also show you but most of these have been destroyed just like we saw on the east wall but at least it gives you an idea of the distances between them and the setup around the railroads and there's a few of these hiding in private property untouched by time as you'll see. Behind me is Vanna von Braun's first test stand down the road is Diebner's nuclear reactor over there is the Maginot Line and all its amazing forts. I'm visiting them all and I'm bringing them to you. So I really appreciate you like, follow and share what I'm doing trying to document all these important historical locations. And if you feel like you want to watch more pictures or documents that are used for these, go to lostbattlefields.com. And if you feel like helping me out with my travels, because gasoline and travel and air for you is expensive, my PayPal is there, protectionservicein.com. You are more than welcome, but you don't have to. I appreciate all your support and all your help, and I love seeing these locations, and I love bringing them to you.